Hi there, and you're welcome to the Three Off the Tee podcast. Our guest today is one of Ireland's greatest ever lady golfers, probably the greatest. She hails from Cavan, and we would have all become aware of Leona as one of the Maguire twins. Her representative honours include a Junior Ryder Cup, a Junior Solheim Cup twice, Curtis Cup three times, Vagliano Trophy four times, Women's World Amateur Team Championship twice, playing for Ireland in the Rio Olympics of 2016, along with the list of personal achievements starting from the age of 10. Leona Maguire, I have to say it's a huge privilege for both myself and Ian to have you on the Three Off the Tee podcast. Thanks for having me, lads. Leona, very good. Listen, thanks very much for coming on. Strange times we're living in, I suppose, at the moment. How's things at home? Yeah, I mean, I suppose the, the main thing that everyone's sort of safe and healthy here. Um, thought I'd be in the States right now in the middle of a seven-week run, but um, yeah. the reality is quite different now. <laughs> and tell me, how are you passing the time? Is it Netflix? Are you getting out to hit a few balls in the back garden? I know I think probably that you can you can get a seven-hour length or something out in the back garden. Yeah, I mean, I suppose I'm lucky that I can do a bit of practice here and can hit a few balls, go collect them, put on my wellies and go collect them again. And I think the ground's not too soft at the minute. Um, and it still can sort of chip and put away and, and do a lot of sort of mirror work as well. And it's kind of going back to what I did when I was in secondary school and in the mornings before school and in the short evenings in the wintertime. And it's kind of going back to basics, really. And then, yeah, lots of board games and card games and all that sort of stuff with the family as well, trying to keep ourselves entertained. Very good, very good. Um, Leona, if we can move to growing up, obviously you took up golf and, and were introduced to it. I know your mum and dad are, are in the education uh, world and, and your dad being a big, big sports fan, he probably introduced it to playing golf, but yourself and Lisa. And I suppose where we all would have come aware of you was both it was the Maguire twins the Maguire twins that's where we heard of you it was it was two of you together very much from a very early age so give me a little bit of your memories going back to age 9 10 when you took up the game and and I suppose maybe some of that competitive rivalry between yourself and Lisa growing up yeah I mean it, it's always been the two of us I suppose people even and I do it without realizing people tell me in interviews I talk about we a lot instead of I, I did this and I did that. I always refer to us as we, um, but I didn't even realise it. And yeah, growing up, we did everything together. Um, we did swimming together, we did football together. I mean, the whole reason we started golf was when Lisa broke her elbow and um, the, the specialist recommended to dad that we take up a racket sport. Um, and when dad heard racket sport, he heard golf. Um, and went to the part three course of the Steve Russell, started off with, with three clubs. I think there were like young gun clubs back then, with a, a driver with a steel shaft, a little seven iron and a, and a putter. And um, I remember going to Dublin to get our first pair of golf shoes was a big deal. Um, and yeah, just kind of start, all started from there and bit by bit worked our way up to, we started off with four hole competitions down in Castle Hume with Sean Donnelly and went to four holes and went to nine holes and then went to, I think it was 14 or 15 and then eventually 18 holes with the lads and, it kind of all just started from there and we were competitive but whatever we did it didn't really matter what it was and um, if it was football in the back garden it was when we were swimming golf I suppose that's what it brought us on without us realizing it we were we were trying to beat each other every day um, and it, it just helped that we were of a similar standard she she beat me one day I was trying to beat her the next or if it, if it took a week or two weeks it just kind of um, spurred us on to be to be better and just on that, it's funny, I was speaking to your coach a bit over the last couple of days, Shane O'Grady, a fellow PGA professional, and, and in fairness, he told me some great stories and stories from many years ago, and, and he advised me to go onto YouTube, and I'd advise all our listeners to go on and have a look at this. You probably cringe at it now, maybe it's 12 years ago, but there's a great video on YouTube of the two years, 13-year-old girls, um, Trans World Sports, you'll remember it, did a piece in the sleeve of Russell Witchy, and, and just exactly as you've described there about you were always looking to get one over on each other. You're you're sitting there on a rock talking about each other's games at 13 years of age. And I think it was Lisa was saying she hit the ball slightly further than you, but she had to accept that maybe you were slightly better with the chipping and putting because maybe you didn't hit it as far. And it's gas to look at that at 13 years of age. Your own awareness of your games at such a young age, but also 
the competitive edge and the, and the understanding of oh well where I need to get better or where I can be better than you and I just found it fascinating I think everyone should go and have a look at it knowing what we know now about both of your wonderful careers uh, since then but if I may ask you another question again my home club was Carlo you know there's a lot of good lady girl players would have come out of Carlo Golf Club as well and, and I'm sure for ye growing up going around playing in scratch cups or in tournaments and being that talented that early and that young, I'm sure in, in some ways it must have been challenging or difficult. Um, maybe the reception or perception that when you went and played in tournaments and won them against ladies that were older or that were maybe of a lower handicap, but you were obviously flying down in handicap. Was that a bit of a challenge or, or did you... Did you bump into the odd person that maybe didn't accept you as much as, or maybe did you not care when you were 13 or 14? Um, I suppose we didn't realise it at the time. We were just playing against each other and playing against the lads. Um, and it wasn't until we started, I suppose, yeah, going to um, the, the IG competitions and playing our first Irish Ladies close down in uh, the European club. That was our first one. And then the next year, Lisa got to the, to the semi final in La Hinch. I think that started to turn a lot of heads. I think that was that was 2007, maybe. So we were we were 12, and she was after getting to the to the semi final in the Hinch, and I think we were kind of going, who who are these girls, and and what are they doing? And then the next year in Westport, we ended up in the final um, against each other, and we we didn't know any different at the time. We were just trying to beat each other. We weren't really paying all that much attention to who else was there, and. Um, and there definitely was a few, there was a few rumblings at the time in, in Westport, <laughs> people that weren't happy, but it was also, we, we've had a lot of support over the years of, um, from everybody really in Ireland, and um, there hasn't really been that, that much of a feeling, I don't think. Yeah, no, great answer, and in fairness, I can imagine, and I, I know from our own golfing backgrounds, absolutely, everyone's kept a very close eye on you for, for a huge number of years, and, and is absolutely delighted to see the progress and continuing progress that you seem to have. So, if I might move it on a little bit then through the years, I suppose, um, playing in more of these events and starting to go away and play abroad a little bit more and, and play in France and these countries, that whole experience at such a young age... Um, yes, it was coming quite naturally to you and you knew nothing else, but it, it must have been some experience to go and travel a little bit and play in some of these tournaments outside of Ireland at a young age. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, the first time we were we were on an airplane was to go to a golf tournament, it was to go over to play in, um, we'd won, I'd won the, the Weed Wonders over in St Andrews, we'd headed over on the boat and the prize was getting to play in the Pro-Am in Wentworth. It was, it was the HSBC event back then and that was our first time on an airplane, um, and it was me that won the prize. But again, back to the, it wasn't I, it was we. I won the prize, but the, the prize was to play a hole on rotation with um, with the pros as they came through. I think it was the second hole, maybe the par three in Wentworth. Mm. And Sorry. Dad insisted that Lisa came, and I had to give half of my turns to Lisa. <laughs> so she got to play half the, half the number of ranks that I did. Um, we got to play with like Goosen and Luke Donald and, and people like that. And it was, I mean, it was an incredible experience, but it was our first time. We'd never been on an airplane before. And then I suppose since then we've been to, I mean, so many countries all over the world, Argentina, Turkey, Brazil, all over America, Mexico and Australia. And I, I mean, I have no doubt that we would have been to half those places if it wasn't for golf. And um, as a family, we would have all, always taken our holidays in Ireland. We'd have gone to Galway or Waterford or Dent Kerry or whatever. So, um, yeah, golf golf's brought us uh, some incredible places. Yeah, and some life experiences at such a young age, considering you're still only 25, and, and as much as you've experienced in your life so far, it, it arguably doubles what anyone else has experienced. But just to finish up on the early, early life stuff, um, again, Shane told me a great story, and, and I read another one recently as well. Obviously, when, when you were introduced to Shane and Shane kind of started to coach you a little bit, he found it very difficult to identify the two of you. And he recalls a, a nice moment where he got you some Footjoy shoes. I think Footjoy were coming out with shoes at the time. You might tell us a little bit about that story and, and the fun that was had there. Yeah, I mean, I suppose like like anyone else, Shane struggled to uh, I suppose to tell the difference when we were, we were younger. I suppose when we're in the hats and all the gear and uh, all whatever chats you have when we're, we're dressed differently. We also used to dress the same when we were younger as well, which 
which caused a lot of struggles. And then um, I think my foot had just come out with my joys, and they weren't long out anyway. And yeah. Shane, uh, for our birthday one year, got us a pair of uh, pink my joys they were at the time with Lisa on one and Leon on the other. And it was all going great until I think one day we landed up to him, but wearing each other's shoes. So, um, <laughs> But he used to be able to tell us by, by our swings pretty early. Our swings were always different, but uh, looks-wise, it was it was a little bit tricky. And, and it was the same as well. That 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 final we played in Westport, uh, that Irish Coast final, um, at least had been, we played the semi-final in the morning wearing the same clothes. And I think the, one of the referees came up to Mam in, in the car park at lunchtime and said, we've got a little bit of a problem. We need, uh, we need the girls to change into different outfits so we'll not know who's... Who's winning what home oh games? Uh, who's winning the whole of what the score is after every hole? So we had to we had to change uh, at lunchtime in the locker room to make sure everybody could tell the difference. So yeah, definitely, definitely, has been a tricky one for some people. Very well. Um, listen, Leon, if I just bring you back as well, I remember the, the, the first time I saw you was it was 2005, 2006. Um, yourself and Lisa was playing in Ballymesey down in Limerick, and it was already mm-hmm. as um harry was saying a, a buzz about the two of you i mean you're you were on people's radars you're in the media etc i just wonder how did, how did you find maybe being in kind of the limelight at the time and i suppose living with it or in it ever since um i suppose we didn't really know any different we were just kind of um doing what we were doing playing golf we didn't really understand i suppose what the buzz was or whether what we were doing was any different to what anybody else was doing um and yeah I suppose Balinese was one of the ones we got sort of early coverage on. I remember those pictures. Are, I still see those pictures resurface from time to time. Um, I remember meeting Paul O'Connell at the driving range and stuff down there as well. One sorry, yeah, yeah. After, after yeah. the matches. And, um, we just got our first full set of ladies clubs down there, I think. And we'd been over to Ping a few weeks before that and had, had started. And we had pink shafts in our clubs. And that was the exciting bit. I suppose everything was just a novelty for us at that, yeah. at that point. Yeah. Um, we were just kind of rolling with it, really. Okay, and listen, we bring it to school then as well. You're 17 years of age. I'm from Ballycon, County Cabin, attending Loretto. And, and, you know, you're doing the leave insert. And, you know, 615 points in the bag then as well, Lisa. I mean, mother of God. So, you know, some going, so I, I, look, I know, as Harry said earlier, your, your parents are, are teachers. But did you enjoy studying? Did you enjoy school? The, the perception is that, you know, everyone hates it really but there's a lot of people out there that are fascinated by it um and the, the acquirement of knowledge or maybe maybe a lot of don't enjoy it. but which sort of camp were you in did you enjoy school or was it something like oh god i can't wait this is over until i can get on the golf course um i suppose it was a mix really um we did get to skip the juniorship because of the curtis cup and we definitely didn't shed any tears over that yeah. <laughs> but, um, no, I mean, we enjoyed school. We had a lot of fun in school. And I suppose Loretta and Kevin were very good to us. They were always quite understanding when we needed to, to miss a few days here and there to go to a golf tournament and, and, and stuff like that. We had a lot of friends. And I suppose the normality of it as well, we enjoyed. We were just one of the girls in school. We weren't, mm. nobody referred to us as the golfers or, or yeah. nobody really knew anything about golf in school. So we were just, um, we played basketball, we played football, and same as everybody else in school. And, um, we've never really been ones that sort of enjoyed the spotlight that much or wanted to stick out and that was kind of the nice thing we blended in quite quite nicely with school and um, we worked hard at school but we mm-hmm. definitely were fortunate that it came I wouldn't say easy to us but it, we didn't have to maybe work as hard as as maybe some things and um, I suppose maths and, and science and stuff were probably my favourites um, yeah. at school and then obviously loved, loved PE as well um, and anytime we got to do that, but there definitely was there definitely was a few days where when the weather was nice outside, there was definitely a question of can I go to the course today instead of school. <laughs> but uh, there was a pretty firm lock from mom, and we were loving it. <laughs> we went. Uh, listen, very good. Then it's Duke University. Why Duke? The, like at the time, there must have been scholarships uh, for nearly every uh, the top um, uh, schools in America. Why particularly did you did you go for Duke? Yeah, I mean, I suppose it was a case of sort of weighing up all the options. We wanted somewhere that that was good academically, that the degree would actually be worth something. Um, mm-hmm. If you were going to put that effort in for the four years, you might as well get a good degree off the back of it. And also a program that has a good reputation, good coaches, good facilities, 
good weather. Um, so there's a lot of sort of factors that went into it, and, and Duke was really just the best of everything. Um, they kind of ticked all those boxes, and we always said we we'd be happy to go to different places. But when we went over and visited, it was just the general consensus. I like this one, and at least I like that one as well. Yeah. Um, they, they've always been one of the best programs in the country. Um, coach Brooks has seven national titles. There's there's no coach that has any more titles than him, and um, the facilities are just incredible. And it was the thing that we could we could play golf all year round, and something that we couldn't do at home. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was just really we thought it was the best option for us. And I'm looking, and you're going away now, and it's it, it's on a more permanent basis. If you want, yes, you've travelled the world with playing up, but it, this is kind of a more permanent basis. I'm I'm just wondering, you're away then from your home, your parents, uh, friends. Yes, Lisa's coming with you, but was there excitement, trepidation, a bit of sadness, or was it like, oh God, we're going off to school in America? Should this is fantastic? Yeah, I mean, I suppose there've been we. I think we decided in October time, it was Halloween time um, of sixth year that we were going. So there was there was quite a long build up and there was some paperwork mm. to be done and um, had been following their competitions and they just won the national championship before we got there. And so it definitely was a lot of excitement. I think we got our leaving surf results on the Wednesday and we headed on the Friday. So there was right. a lot of packing. <laughs> and, um, it was pretty hectic up to that. And um, yeah, um, obviously I had to, to pack up all of that and then Mam came over with us at the start um, to for about a week or so to, to help us get moved in and um, get what we needed to get and just get us sort of sorted and all that. And then she, she flew home. And I think it wasn't probably until she flew home and we were there in the dorm room by ourselves <laughs> going, OK, this is the reality of this is setting in now. Um, but we, we were so busy and, as, again, the novelty of it all, the practice, going to the tournaments, all the facilities, and everybody was really in the same boat, like, I suppose college yeah. in the States, it's not like at home where I had friends that would come home every weekend to, to get the yeah. laundry done or the cooking and, and maybe had a part-time job at the weekends. Every, nobody in college went home at the weekends. Everybody was from out of state or out of the country mm -hmm. or even if they were in state, they, they didn't go home all that often. And there was so much stuff going on that um, there wasn't as much time to maybe be homesick or, or stuff yeah. like that. Um, even though we were, I mean, we Skyped home and all that um quite often but yeah no it was it was definitely a fun time getting getting sort of settled in and all that yeah well you settled in pretty well looking um in terms of your golfing career because i mean you had three wins there i think the darius rucker at hilton head went down to greensboro one there and then the ncaa in uh the south region i think in early may so at that time then i mean you're only over there seven eight months at this stage and you're now the world number one ranking amateur. Can you remember how you found out or how did you celebrate? Was there a build up to it? Or I, I just want to, to find out that you're the best in the world. You're the best in the world. Like how, tell us from people that are not the best in the world, how, how does that feel? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't really something I was paying all that much attention to. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't logging in every week to check the rankings to see where I was. It was a case of, I was just trying to win in tournaments I'd had a few seconds and top fives in the in the fall season before that and I was getting a bit frustrated and dad was telling me to be I was ringing home but dad was telling me to be patient to be patient and um I was just delighted to to get those wins more so than anything else and um I think I got a phone call from from Greg Allen one morning um, and obviously there was a five hour time difference and uh between sort of home and, and North Carolina and mm. I think the rankings had come out at noon or something like that so I got a phone call shortly after seven o'clock one day from Greg saying you've gone to world number one how do you feel and I was like <laughs> good to know I didn't I had I mean I had no idea um, and I probably didn't really grasp it really at the time either um, and, and then every so often I'd, I'd get phone calls or messages from people being it's it's been so many weeks it's been so many weeks how do you feel now how do you feel now um and it really wasn't something I paid all that much attention I was more focused on what I was doing at college and it kind of all just just added up to to that okay uh, listen there's something I've been dying to talk to you about Anna, and I think it's for nearly all elite athletes and players is time management right throughout your career I'm wondering how have you managed like your golf your studying family friends uh, your life, I suppose, is a successful exercise in, in time, um, if being efficient, time management. Was, was there a conscious decision throughout your life or was it, was it probably instilled from your parents 
Was there a daily structure, a weekly structure? And then how did you change it up to keep it more um, interesting, I suppose? Yeah, I mean, uh, time management's obviously huge. Um, it was a big thing, especially in college, when um, we'd have a tournament coming up and maybe there was essays or papers to submit in college and you had a test coming up and you knew you were going to miss a bit of work, so you'd, you'd try and get ahead or... Um, so you wouldn't have so much to do when you get there or you wouldn't have an awful lot to do when you would be to catch up when we got back. And um, I suppose I've never been one that's been great for late nights. I'd rather get up early and do it in the morning. So, um, yeah, you just really had to sort of plan out your day quite well and, and make sure that you weren't wasting time at silly stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Just prioritise, I suppose, what was most important um, to make sure you, you got the most out of your days. Um, yeah, so re- routine was definitely important. I suppose that's that's something mum and dad definitely helped with from a young age. They they were used to drawing up timetables in school for the kids and, and getting people into routine. So um, they definitely helped on that. And in terms of your golf, then g- g- growing up with Shane um, and still being a huge part while you're still over in the states again, did he like instill a, a kind of a routine for in terms of what way you were to go about your practice? Yeah, definitely. We've had we've had different routines over the years, depending on mm. on what I've been working on. And um, obviously, when I was when I'm here, I get to see Shane quite a bit, which is nice, and to check in with things and um, keep an eye on things and make sure it's sort of trending in the right direction. And then then when I'm away, we can we can do it through WhatsApp and, and video calls and stuff. And um, we'll we'll pull up videos from a year or two ago, or maybe sometimes even ten years ago, um, yeah. and keep a check on things and. Um, yeah, no, we've definitely had sort of we've had checkpoints along the way that we've we've liked to hit. I suppose okay. Shane kind of likes to describe it as a ladder, checking off the every rung in the ladder, moving up the ladder, um, along the way. And I suppose that's that's kind of the way we've approached it. And everything's been in quite a methodical way, um, okay. and we haven't moved on to the next level until we've we've kind of made sure everything on that level is is done properly. Excellent. And listen, then you, you come back, right, um, uh, to play in, you get an invitation to play in the, the European uh, Lady Sewer, the ISPC um, hand uh, in, I think it was Buckham, Buckinghamshire, I think, in July, and you finished second, right? And, yeah. you know, as an amateur, finishing second, uh, we'll talk about the 50 grand in a while, right? But <laughs> I'm just talking, your, your thoughts for the week, the atmosphere, I mean, as it, at its very core, how do you treat situations like that are you are you one to be nervous the night before not get any sleep or maybe that you're so used to it over now at 10 12 years and just wondering for for you to finish second in a major major tournament at such a young age um how do you how do you deal with that yeah i suppose no i i wasn't all that nervous to be honest i i suppose that's the benefit of of playing so many events probably from a young age i played irish opens in port marinick and clean castle i'd I played a British Open and, and stuff like that. So I wasn't all that bothered about the crowds. It was it was quite big crowds, actually. And a decent amount of Irish people came out as well. Um, so we weren't far from London. And um, I think I was a few groups back on into the last day. So I wasn't really thinking about winning all that much or, or anything like that. And um, it wasn't until we got to the 17th green, um, which was a drivable par four. And I mean, on the tee box, I had looked at dad and looked at the driver and there was water and bunkers all around the room. He said, sure, have a lash at it. We had no idea what was going on. Hit it up into the back bunker, got up and down for birdie and then looked at the leaderboard. And I think I was I was either tied for the leader or one back or something and um, had no idea that the leaders had dropped back. Um, hadn't There wasn't that many scoreboards, anything like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, so there wasn't really any any reason to be nervous for me. I had nothing to lose. I knew I wasn't going to win money either way. And <laughs> I wasn't like the pros sort of worried about was I keep, keeping their cards or, or anything like that. I was just, it was kind of a, it was a bonus week for me. I was, I was just fresh off the Vagliano um, in Malone. And then I was, I was supposed to head to the European Championships in Denmark that evening. I was just worried about whether I was going to make my flight to Denmark or not. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, you get to play then in uh, the fifth and final major of the year, the Evian Championship. Um, you know, you, you finished, I think, the leading amateur, uh, the first uh, moment from the Republic to, to, to make the cut. And, you know, as an amateur, again, then you can't accept uh, the 18,000 euros. I, I'm thinking another 68 grand here now, gone in the last few weeks. Is, is there anything 
inside it that goes, you know what, I'm pretty good at this. Um, and I suppose you've been asked countless times over the years, why not turn pro then? Yeah, I suppose after the Buckingham share, I definitely got a lot of calls after that. Um, and then there was a lot of ifs and buts and, and all of that. And maybe if I would have won then, I would have turned pro. I would have had a, a guaranteed European tour card and, and all of that. And um, and in hindsight now, I'm I'm glad I didn't win. Um, I would have given my right arm to win at the time. But yeah, of course. Um, it's all, it's all kind of worked out well. And I suppose we'd been feeling questions about... <coughs> Return pro for for years, and uh, probably since we were about sixteen, and um, the curse cup when we were fifteen, and since then we were getting we were getting questions of when he turn a pro, when he turn a pro, and I suppose we always said it wasn't a case of are we turn a pro, it was a case of just when, and um, I always said I'd do it. Back to what we were talking about, Shane and the and the rungs of the ladder, I'd do it when I felt like I was ready and I'd enough boxes ticked that. Um, that I felt like I'd be, I'd be able to go out and tour and, and compete. And um, I suppose being a pro, is, it's very different to being an amateur. There's a lot more events, a lot more travel. There's a lot sort of that goes along with it, maybe then that people don't realise. And and it is a job. You don't expect that many 16-year-olds to go into a, a full-time <laughs> like, job like that. So I was definitely a lot more prepared as a as a 23-year-old than I would have been as a, as a 15, 16-year-old. <laughs> Leon, if we can change gear a little bit and we might move to your experiences in the Curtis Cup. Obviously, uh, you've played three times, as we all know. 2010 was a very special one, obviously, for a couple of reasons. It, uh, being your first will always be special uh, to play alongside your sister, the two you make the team. You to be the youngest ever uh, lady girl at 15 to make the Curtis Cup team only by 15 minutes in fairness uh, with, with Lisa coming quickly minutes, though. <laughs> very important but give me some of your experiences obviously that first year Mary McKenna was the non-playing captain that must have been very special 2016 equally playing it at home here in Ireland but try and sum up maybe some experiences from your time playing Curtis Cup yeah, I mean, I played three different ones. They were obviously, yeah, very different experiences. I suppose America was, so we were kind of thrown in at the deep end, that one in Essex. Um, there was a very strong American team with Lexi Thompson and Jessica Cord and, and all those girls were on that team. And um, there was massive crowds. And I suppose I'll never forget the the USA chants um, ringing around the golf course. Um, and we'd never experienced anything like it before. We played in the Junior Ryder Cup and Junior Solan Cups, but this it was on another level altogether. And I remember deciding when some of the girls were deciding who was going to tee off first, who was going to go on the odds and evens in the in the foursomes. And there was a few girls that said they couldn't because they weren't they were afraid they wouldn't get the ball teed up or they wouldn't get it off the tee box. Um, so needless to say, I went off this. I went off first in our foursomes match. I didn't really think too much about it um, but yeah no it was it was great I remember I got to play with Lisa in, in some of the foursomes of four worlds played with Danielle McFay as well and obviously six foot Danielle with 15 year old me taking four steps for every stride that she took up the fairways and um, mom and dad and Oran were there and um, yeah I mean it, it's one of those sort of experiences you'll You'll never really forget and, and we were just kids at the time and, and got to skip the junior share over as well it clashed with our but our junior shirt, it was the, the second week of June. So um, we were just having a ball being over um, in Boston for, we got to go over a week early and play, did some practice matches, got to tour around Boston and then um, just play the Curtis Cup. And yeah, we just, we just thought it was the greatest thing ever. And then obviously it was disappointing not to win. We got, we got fairly close. Um, I think we had the singles, which was a big deal for us on the last day. And then, um, Got the trophy back in Nairn in Scotland in some some brutal weather, um, and then yeah, I mean Dunleary's always going to be my favourite. Um, it's going to be hard to beat winning a winning a Curtis Cup um, on home soil. Crowds were fantastic, venue was fantastic, um, and yeah, to, played, to finish off, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> contributing yeah, four I points. We, I suppose I suppose that that Saturday is always going to be special. Um, the way we sweeped all those matches in the afternoon on on um, Saturday, coming out out after that weather today, um, I think me and Charlotte Thomas went birdie birdie eagle birdie birdie or something like that, and um, it, it it was a lot of fun to say the least. And, and 
it, it, it's, it's always nice when you get to sort of play those team events. We don't get to play team events all that often as golfers. So when you get to have people that you're you're playing against all year round to come together as a team and see those dynamics and you have a lot of fun and crack um, during the week as well, both, both on and off the golf course, which is which is nice. Yeah, amazing experiences to have alongside your sister in that first one. And, and as you said, through three series of the Curtis Cup. And again, 2016, you know, not that long ago, but to have all those experiences by the age of, of what, 20, 21, it's uh, quite, quite amazing reason, uh, reasonably. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, 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 in Dunleary, I was considered, I suppose, a veteran on the team. Um, I didn't feel like it, but... Yeah, it was. I think me and me and Bronte had both played um, two at that point, and um, we were the only ones that had won a Curtis Cup before, and we were kind of looked on as as the leaders um, and the veterans on that team. And um, I remember going out the first day in the four ball match in the afternoon, and we said, "Listen, we're going to get this point to the board as quickly as we possibly can, and send a message back to the rest of the team." And that's what we did. And yeah, it's it, it's very different, sort of that experience on the third one versus that very first one in um, in out in Essex, where we were just kind of going along with it, with everybody else in, leaning on Mary for advice and all the rest of the girls, and um, we were just two two kids really um, at that time. And listen, we go on to the Olympics now as well um, in Brazil. Twenty one years of age, you're now an Olympian. I'm just wondering what the, that kind of a an experience was like we spoke to, I suppose, Paul Harrington and Paul McGinley in, in recent times, and they, they I think, look at it one that the kind of the pinnacles of their career. I will actually listen. You might have heard of Justin, uh, Justin Rose last night. He was, I think, the, the the presenter. I think it was Sky Sports said, "Look, if I was to give you another U.S. Open or another gold medal, uh, which one did you take?" Now he said he'd take your gold medal, but if it was the Open Championship, there there might be a little bit of a toss up there. Where I'm just when you're. Your whole experience of that, because I can, from the outside looking in, it, it looks amazing. And how important is it to you? And again, with it being now cancelled this year uh, and being pushed back another year, um, along with every everything else, um, that must be kind of a little bit of a disappointment too. Yeah, obviously, had been looking forward to it. It was it was going to be one of the highlights of this year, and um, for sure. Um, I mean, Rio was incredible. I suppose I'd grown up as a as a sports fan my entire life, watching the Olympics and Sydney's probably the first one I remember of of Sonia getting her silver medal and and um, and watching Athens and Beijing and um, watching Casey win her gold in London and um, yeah, back when we were swimmer we younger, hoped they would go to the Olympics as a swimmer and um, never thought it would be as a golf. But yeah, no, I mean it's one of those sort of things to dream about and then it's a little bit surreal when you're actually there and um, enjoyed every minute of it got to I think I got to make the first party of the Olympics on the women's side which was just yeah. kind of cool for me and um, yeah staying in the village with all the rest of the athletes going to breakfast going to lunch going to, to cheer them on in the evenings didn't really matter what sport was on and there'd always be a group that was going to something and um, it was yeah it was nice to see all those those people that you kind of read about or we bump into sort of one year at all the award ceremonies at Christmas time to actually go watch them compete and cheer them on and there was a there was a real sense of sort of camaraderie between the Irish team which was which was a special thing to be part of. Of course, of course. And I mean that's only over and then you're back to Duke. I think you had announced that you you were going to turn pro and you you successfully completed I think stage two of the qualifying uh, school, but you withdrew, withdrew with kind of stage three uh, and went back to Duke. Was that always the plan to pull out before stage three, or was it something, or, or is there anything that kind of swayed your decision a bit? No, I mean I entered Q school thinking I was gonna I was gonna go all the way, um, and yeah, I suppose I think it was it was a few weeks before sort of the deadline for stage three, and uh, the coaches at Duke had had sat me down and. Um, brought me to see the director of the university, Dr. White, and um, kind of encouraged me, I suppose, to see the bigger picture a little bit. Um, also a few phone calls with dad as well. Um, and just kind of stepped back a little bit and kind of wondered why we were rushing it so much. Um, I, I was kind of halfway through my time at Duke, was having an incredible time there. It obviously helped me an awful lot. Um, and we just kind of wondered if, what's two more years in the grand scheme of things, the LPGA was always going to be there. Um, 
And if, if two, two more years of Duke under my belt, have a degree, have two more years of experience and coaching and, and all of that behind me, if, if it had served me better. So, um, yeah, just kind of um, went back on that decision, really, and um, glad I did. Yeah, very much so. I mean, and we were looking at 2017, your results then, like over 10 events, you registered eight top fives, three victories, nine rounds in the 60s, 21 rounds on the par, finished no lower than tied six. I mean, the the, the records just... It's boring, Ian, in, isn't it? It's boring. I, I know boring. it is, Harry, yeah. I'm actually nodding off here for flip's sake, you know. <laughs> at the, like, I mean, yeah, at the time... I mean, at the time, our assistant coach, John, I remember sitting in his office when we were sort of deciding and stuff, and he sat me down and he was looking at all my results and everything I'd done. And he said, I don't think you've won a lot, Leona. And he was, he was being deadly serious. <laughs> um, I had a lot of top fives and a lot of seconds and stuff. And he said, you haven't won enough. Um, and I suppose I took that as a little bit of a challenge. Um, yeah. And then had those, those three more wins um, fairly soon after that. And I, I think I was walking off the green at the ACC Championship and he, he kind of walked up the last few holes with me. And uh, he said it to me walking up the green. He said, you listen to me anyway. You, <laughs> you got those few more wins, didn't you? You just couldn't help it. Yeah. And I uh, hadn't mentioned it since then when he said it that day in his office. But I suppose he'd, he'd kind of remembered. And, and maybe in his way, he'd, he'd said it to me. No one would find well what he was doing to, to sort of motivate me. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at you. You're, the scoring average is 70.29. It's only it's the second lowest average, uh, you know, after L- Lorena Ochoa, um, and, and and just when you're clearly, clearly by a mile the best player in, in, in the world at the moment, how does the best player keep improving? How do you set up, how do you structureize, I suppose, everything while studying at the same time? Yeah, I suppose I was lucky. Duke was such a great environment to be in. I was, I mean, you were in an environment surrounded by other Olympians, guys who were going to the NBA, people that were wanted to go into careers curing cancer and big lawyer jobs and um, big government jobs and all that. And I suppose everybody was just sort of reaching for excellence. Everybody was doing something incredible. And what I was doing was really no different. I'd go win a tournament at the weekend and I'd be back in class on Monday morning, same as everybody else. Um, and I was, I was very fortunate that the coaches didn't make a big deal of what I was doing either. I was treated no differently than, than anybody else was on the team, which I quite enjoyed. Um, and it definitely pushed me as well to, to keep doing. I never sort of got complacent or, or anything like that. I was always sort of pushing to do better, pushing to do more. Um, I was lucky that I had great teammates there as well that pushed me. Some of our, we'd have to play qualifying competitions before we went to the tournament. Coach never exempted me for them. I always had to battle for my place just as much as everybody else. And um, it always kept me on my toes. And, and we had some battles in in college, me, especially me and um, Celine Boutier from France, who obviously is, mm. she's won on tour now and played Solon Cup. And we had some bigger battles at home at Duke than we did in, in tournaments. Um, and that definitely stood to me as well when we when we went to some of those bigger events. Yeah, of course. Like, and I'm leaving out you win the British Amateur in Wales as well that year. If, if I can go on to 2018, then we're coming up, I suppose, to the time that you, you are going to turn pro. Um, you broke uh, Lydia Coe's uh, record for being the world number one in 131 weeks, which is, which is an amazing stat. I mean, all these records, and uh, I, I mean, I was kind of a bit of all when it was when we were going to do this interview today, because if you look up your Wikipedia page, I mean, you could spend days at it. It's, it and, and, and anyone who's listening, I suggest sure they actually do look yeah. It's about uh, it's about thirteen A four pages a day yeah. being actually that's what it is, yeah. That's what it is, Harry. I know I know Harry, I'm bloody being through it, I tell you. But I, I just want then like you're you're about to do it. You are presented with the Duke University Lifetime Achievement Award. I presume that that must be pretty high up on um the list of things that you've done as well, you know? Yeah, absolutely, I suppose. I think the big one for me was was winning the British Am that summer. That was kind of the last thing I really wanted to check off yeah. on my list before I turned pro. Um, went into that with, I suppose, a lot of the best players in the world were there over in Wales, and I had a big, I had a massive target on my back. There's no point saying any different. And um, to come through that, it, it is a marathon event, and to come through that was was a big thing for me. And then, yeah, to go back to Duke and to get a reward like that. Um, it was voted on by the coaches and the and all the other athletes, I suppose. And that's mm. what probably 
um, yeah. meant an awful lot to me. There was a lot of um, incredible athletes that had done some great things there, um, and for them to recognise that that my what I had done was was worthy of that was was quite special to me, and um, wasn't something I was expecting at all. Um, I think they had Lisa presented as well. Lisa knew I had no idea, and she was. I was making guesses yeah. throughout the week of who I thought was going to win it, and she was like, "Oh yeah, you're probably right. you're probably right." <laughs> um, Popping me off and whatever, but I, I genuinely had no idea, um, and didn't think I would win it either. Yeah, and I'm looking then. I mean, the academic side of things as well. You're, you know, you've a 3.94 um, grade average to, to us here in Ireland. That's a that's the 90th percent to Laura and a Harry. I know Harry hasn't seen many A's yeah, in his life, but seen many you know, of those. <laughs> but I'm wondering then you have a degree in psychology, certificate in markets and management studies, and okay, as you said, like the British Am the previous year probably was uh, was the last kind of wrong maybe on the ladder in terms of your amateur career. Uh, I'm just wondering then, kind of maybe on an emotional side or leaving Duke, um, clearing out the apartment and everything like that. How was that, or was it like full steam ahead now? I want to turn pro and. I just want to, because again, it's another transition in your life. Yeah, definitely. I mean, those those four years flew by. Um, it, they went by so fast. wasn't expecting that at all. And then um, mom and dad and Laura, they all came over for graduation. Um, and it was nice to have all, them all over there um, at that. And that was the first time mom and Laura had both been over before. Um, so they had, they had seen Duke and seen everything about it. Dad had just heard about it. Um, nice. And just, seen it on video and, and whatever else but it was it was the first thing he he got to see it for himself and and talk to everybody and meet some of our friends and and the coaches and and sort of got a taste of it and um i didn't think he didn't realize how incredible of a place it was he, he had a fair idea but he didn't fully grasp it i think until he got over there and saw it for himself and um, and that was another sort of reminder that that we definitely we picked a good place to spend the those four years and um so yeah they helped us sort of show them around and everything and all that for the week and um had the graduation and all of that and got our degrees and the cap and gown and, and all that in the football field and then um packed up and then went to a to a US open qualifier and then went to nationals with the team our golf season wasn't over that was the thing school finished with <clears throat> an event to play and then a couple of weeks later, we were we were turn pro at our at our first event at the shop right in New Jersey. So it all it all moved very fast. There wasn't much time to sort of sit down and look back and think much about it. It was it was very much full steam ahead. Um, at that point. And if we take that date, then Leona, which will go down in history uh, right now and in the future, the 5th of June 2018, it's only just over a year and a half ago, uh, but yourself and Lisa turning pro and joining Modest Golf and, and Niall Horn, who we all know. So I know you sat down and, and probably um, taught long and hard about what company you'd like to, to join and, and for them to manage all things and represent you. But talk us through that whole decision and, and maybe some of the first couple of tournaments and uh, that you played as well as a professional yeah i mean they went a they went a lot of planning and everything into turn up pro i suppose i'd been doing stuff for at least a year in advance um getting visas sorted figuring out um what management company i wanted to go with had a lot of different meetings and that was another another perk of being at duke as well there was there was an entire committee set up for all of that stuff for athletes turn up pro Mainly because of the basketball guys, but um, I got to bail of it as well, which was which was quite nice. So I had a lot of help. I was I very much wasn't doing it on my own, which um, I probably couldn't have done it um, on my own. Um, so I was lucky to kind of have have that all in place when when I did turn pro. It it definitely wasn't an overnight thing. There was a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails and and all of that figuring it all out. And um, it was nice then to to sort of play that first event. They modest. Um, Got both myself and Lisa and invited into that that first event in, at the shop right and um it was a nice one to start with um in New Jersey. There was a decent amount of Irish people actually come out. A few people flew over as well, which was, which was incredible. Um yeah, started off there, went and then Symmetra tour then sort of for the for the rest of the summer learned the ropes a little bit on it going from um tournament to tournament, which was it was definitely a shock to the system. I'd never played that many events in that short of time before I, this was in the amateur game you play two three events and then you have a break for a few weeks and then you play another event and a break for a few weeks and big events are all 
sort of scattered out, whereas sort of uh, those first few events in the Symmetra Tour, it was, um, I think I went seven, eight weeks in a row because I was playing catch up and I had never, hadn't really prepared for that bit of it. I wasn't expecting that bit of it. Um, and it definitely took a lot more out of me than I thought it would. Yeah, you say you haven't prepared for it, but your first six rounds as a pro were all in the 60s. Now, uh, you know, I can't remember the last time I shot a round in the 60s. Uh, I probably had a... Did I you ever had a, one I did, Ian, I probably, but I probably had a handicap the last time I did it. But um, talk to me about, like, you know, getting out on tour. That first round, I'm sure you must remember that, or, or, or some of those first six rounds. I know, obviously, then, when you play your debut tournament on the Symmetra, you actually had a hole-in-one that day. But, like, tell us... You know, six rounds in the 60s, your first six rounds as a pro. That's absolute dream stuff. I know you've shot umpteen rounds in the 60s in the previous five years, but still, this is a new experience. This is a new level. And and just talk us through maybe some of those feelings out on tour in the early few weeks. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose it, it definitely gave me a lot of confidence of that. I, I belonged out there that I shot those scores in college, but to bring that straight away into the, the pro ranks was good. Was quite reassuring and um yeah i mean that first tee shot i'll probably not forget that i was off i was off the back nine and ten and i think i hit a three wood down the fair and, and hit a wedge onto the green and and hold the putt for birdie so that that kind of really settled me and and just kept going from there and and like i said my first my first symmetra event and uh it was in the second round i had a, a hole in one at number 17 which um they don't come along that often haven't had one since in a competition so um <laughs> It was it was it was a special week to have one then as well. No car, unfortunately, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it was still a good one. To have. Actually, just, uh, just on that topic, how many hole in ones have you? Uh, in a competition, I've had five. Five, and not in competitions then, in total. Oh, I mean, I, I've kind of lost count. I don't count them anymore oh. as well. Oh, oh, my God. God. <laughs> I don't count all the ones anymore. <laughs> You're rubbing it in here now, Harry. You're rubbing it in here. <laughs> Listen, uh, Leon, if we go on to the 2019 season, right? Your first, I suppose, real tour in the, the Symmetra Tour. You finished fourth, I think, in the uh, IOA Championship. Um, and on the 7th then of April, you win your first uh, tournament at the, the Windsor Classic, rounds of 70, 69, 65, that bogey-free seven birdies. Um, I mean, you're cracking front nine. And then it was a, I think it was a playoff with uh, Anna or Karen, and she birdied, I think it was a four the last six. I'm thinking that tournament, and yes, it's a win. And I suppose the last couple of holes of that tournament compared to maybe the last couple of holes of winning the British Amateur, which is probably the pinnacle of, of your amateur career. What has been the main kind of difference um, between the amateur and the professional game that you've seen? Um, I suppose the big difference is the amount of birdies that you need to make. I suppose there's been weeks where we've had cuts on, on tour that have been four or five under par. Um, and you rarely see that in, in the amateur game. A lot of the time in the amateur tournaments, A, there's a lot of match play. B, there's a lot of playing in brutal conditions on links courses where you're getting battered by by wind and rain and keeping it close to par is is a good job um mm. whereas in the, in the pro game it's uh it's very different a lot of the time you're playing in very nice very nice course very nice conditions and it's just a case of going as low as you possibly can and yeah like you said that first win i knew i had to go out that morning and shoot shoot a low one if i was going to have any chance of coming close to the leaders um at that point so um yeah you definitely know how to, have to know how to how to go low and, and be consistent as well and uh, the the win itself was it um was it excitement was there a sense of relief you know you mean you hear from an awful lot of players when they win the first event it's it's nearly more relief than anything else because it kind of proves or, or their decision or, or, or assists their decision in, in turning pro and I, I think validates it really. So um, how, how was it for you? Um, obviously exciting too. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose the big thing for me that week was I'd gone into the week before leading into the last round and mm. um, I didn't play particularly well. The weather wasn't great, but I didn't play particularly well um, and ended up losing, I think, by two shots. Um, and was really, really disappointed. And I remember ringing home and talked to mom, talked to dad, and them telling me, you're playing well, be patient, be patient. And it was I was sort of getting flashbacks to college again, dad telling me to be patient and me not wanting to be patient. Um, 
and yeah, I suppose it was it was it was a mixture of relief and at the same time it it was very rewarding seeing that that putt disappear and um it was probably I suppose it was a little different in that I wasn't even going into the last round I was I was a decent ways back and and I was just trying to post as low as number as I could and then and and then just waited um and then at the playoff as well trying to just trying to make a birdie up that last hole um, which I managed to do. Yeah, I remember it was all hours at the time we were watching it through Twitter and that. So, yeah, I'm thrilled, absolutely thrilled at the time for you. Um, listen, you want to May, then you go over to Dubai, have a great first round, finish fifth there, um, onto the US Open, qualify for that. Um, then you're back into the Symmetra Tour and just beaten in a playoff, five hole play, uh, playoff as well uh, to Maria Parra. Then go on to the next week and you're winning North Carolina. Um, you're top of the money list, um, and I mean, you've jumped up to, I think, a world ranking of 174, 444 places. You've jumped, I mean, uh, scoring average is about 69. I mean, things are, are, are really going well. And, and again, 6th of October rocks around, and you've secured your, your tour card. Um, you have 16 events, just one missed cut, and you join, you know, compatriot Stephanie, Stephanie Meadow, I think, would be the first time in history. Ireland has two professions on the, the LPGA Tour. Um, so I know I'm going through a lot there, but if you can bring me back to uh, your second win, um, and I mean, I suppose, yeah, losing in the five hole full playoff, but I, I think from us on the outside and from what we've heard over the year, the top players, it's always about putting yourself in a position to win and you'll eventually pick them off. If, is, is that the way you look at it or is it just event by event by event? Yeah, I mean... I suppose that, that that was the big for, thing for me. I was putting myself in contention nearly every week at the start um, of last year. And um, I played really well in that last round in Atlanta to get myself into that playoff. Um, and played as well as I possibly could have in the playoff. Um, I think I birdied all the holes par one. Um, and then she, she beat me in the end. With a, we, were in, we were down to, it was two of us in the end from, from mm. four or five or whatever started. And... Um, she eagled it and I birdied and I I walked off the course that day not all that disappointed um, yeah I would have loved to have won but I didn't feel like I lost it she won yeah. it that day there wasn't really much I could have done and um, I suppose went into, into into the next week in quite a positive mindset knowing that I was playing well um, and was back in North Carolina and we pulled up to the golf course that day and everything just looked so so similar to Duke and what I'd been used to all the trees and the layout of the golf course and I remember saying it to my caddy, John, I was like, this is, I've played in this for the last four years. Um, I like it here. And, and yeah, that week just, I was staying with a really nice host family that week, just off the 16 tee box. And um, that week just, um, I felt like I was back playing in college again and, and really in my element. And um, yeah, ended up winning by four or five shots that week and, and just played, played some really, really solid golf on, on a course that I, hadn't seen before. I had got some advice from uh, Seamus Power the week before on it um, because he played um, some of us golf there and they used to have a web.com event there. So mm. I got a little bit of advice for him and um, yeah, just enjoyed by being back in, in North Carolina, even if it was only for a week. Absolutely. And we move on then nicely on to the LPGA Tour, obviously this year and because of the virus and pandemic that we're all going through now, um, you've only been had two events, but obviously the, the one down in Australia it must have been some experience to kind of to play in that and to and to play so well um, to miss out on the playoff. And I've seen you quoted as saying that you know you, you didn't really feel you were quite in it, even though you only missed out on the playoff by one shot. But give us your experience of of uh, finishing just one shot off that playoff and and the rounds that you shot there down there in the FPS <coughs> hander. Yeah, I mean, um, I was lucky to have, uh, to have gotten an invite into that um, that tournament the year before, so I knew what to expect. I knew um, it was going to be windy. It was going to be a linksy sort of course. So I'd done a bit of links practice with Shane um, in Port Warwick and stuff before before I flew down. And um, yeah, it was it was just it was a really draining week. Had to be so so patient um, and. Yeah, um, just kind of was taking very much one each round as it came. Um, two golf courses that week, obviously playing with the lads for um, the same course. So it was, it was quite a lot of buzz around the event. And um, there was I could tell there was a lot of people getting frustrated with the conditions. And um, I was just kind of smiling and thinking to myself, this is what I've grown up in. I've played so many 
and um, Scottish Opens and Irish Opens and British Ams and all that sort of stuff in this kind of weather. And um, I remember in, in one of the practice rounds, I was hitting pod shots and my caddy, get Gary, and I remember saying to him, are we hitting this, I think it was an eight or a seven, nine, one hole, I was like, full shot or punch shot? And he was like, punch shots, we're never hitting a full shot again this week. <laughs> yeah. And we just kept the ball as low as we possibly could and, and plotted our way around the course, which um, I quite like it when I have to think. And um, definitely those conditions sort of challenge you in ways that maybe you wouldn't otherwise be challenged for the rest of the year. Yeah, magic and look. Let's hope that we get back to some kind of schedule. I suppose you're as much in the dark as anyone um, as regards when that will be. Um, I know your next event was due to be now in 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 early May, was it? So um, yeah, God knows. But it, it's going to be strange, isn't it, to try and pack all these tournaments? Or, or obviously the majors will have some uh, precedence. But what's your thoughts on what may happen for the rest of the season? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've really no idea. Um, I was getting ready to head back to the States, uh, I suppose, a couple of weeks ago now before our, our event got cancelled. And we've been told they're, they're sort of taking it three events at a time. Um, we've had nine events cancelled so far due to starting in Florida in second week of May. Who knows? Um, maybe we will, maybe we won't. Um, we've already rescheduled two of the majors. Um, the ANA is, is now in September and um, the Evian's got pushed back a little bit as well now the, the Olympics being gone out of the, the calendar. But yeah, I mean, it's just a case of trying to prepare as best I can here and, and be ready for whenever the LPGA says we're going again. But um, yeah, there's a lot bigger things going on in the world right now than, than golf. And dad definitely wasn't keen on me heading back to the States in, in the middle of all of this. So yeah. Um, Haven is the safest place for me right now. Absolutely. No better place to be than home. It brings us nicely on to a feature that we do at the at the end of every piece, uh, Leona. You'll enjoy this. It's uh, 18 rapid fire questions. Uh, we like to think that it's played on, on a golf course, 18 holes for 18 questions. So you might just tell us which is your favorite golf course in the world. And if you can't pick one, we'll allow you two or three. But uh, <laughs> where would you like to complete this this game? Oh, the tough one. Um, I quite like Kings Barnes. Kings Barnes has definitely been one of my favourites. And I think un- quite underrated as well. Yeah, very good. All we'll right. go with that. Excellent, right. We'll kick him off. So, uh, first one, number, poll number one. Highlight of your amateur career? Uh, it's got to it's gotta be Rio. I was still an amateur in Rio. Between Rio and that British Am, um, they're probably the two big ones. Okay, very no, you haven't had many of these, but the low point of your amateur career. Oof. Um probably, I suppose in college it was always the the thing I was I was second in the national championship twice and never got that win. So that was probably it missing out on coming that, that close and, and missing out on them. Um that was kind of the one thing that the only real thing that I that I wish I could have done before I turned pro. Okay, next one. Any travel faux pas you have ever made? Um, now, be careful, Leona. I asked this with a bit of previous knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> Which <your> sports is that? <laughs> Maria, Maria Dunn. Oh, yes, that was a bad one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me and Maria. It was at the Bagliano, I think, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's it, yeah. Me and Maria yeah. got off the plane. <laughs> too busy chatting and joking and laughing and we just walked straight out in past security and then realized five minutes later we'd no bags <laughs> yeah that was i'd forgotten about that one yeah that was an england summer i are think you, on our way to italy <laughs> are you reminding of it uh, reminding you of it might make you smile all right uh, <laughs> next one a bucket list course that you haven't played yet that's got to be augusta hasn't it yeah yeah that's very good, good. Right, next one. Quick nine or range time? Uh, quick nine. Okay. We have a time machine. As crazy as that sounds, right? Do you want to go into the future or the past? Past. I think it'd be, it'd be quite cool to, to sort of see Jack Nicholas and Ben Hogan and all those guys in their, in their heyday. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Next one, your favourite takeaway? Ooh. Hmm. 
Probably. It's hard to beat a good fish and chips, I suppose. They don't have it in America, so sometimes I come home, I'll have that. Right, very good. And following on from the that national team, Tato crisps or Lay's potato chips? That's going to be Tato's. Love it. <laughs> Cheese love and it. onions. <laughs> your most memorable round of golf. Doesn't have to be your best one. Your most memorable. It's probably it's it's probably that um that afternoon four balls match at the Curtis Cup in Dunleary that one where I was, I was saying earlier where we went we went birdie birdie eagle birdie birdie um to beat um to beat the Americans and, and sort of sweep that afternoon. Yeah, very good one. Okay, um, rice. We've got chicken curry in front of you. Do you have rice or chips? I go half and half. That's yeah, it. Man, you can you can definitely go half and half. <laughs> Uh, next one, your favourite major championship winning moment. Oh, wow. It's got to be Lowry's last summer. Um, I watched, I suppose we were we were playing the Symmetra event up in Rochester. And I, I got to watch the last two holes and what we watched the, him win um, in the pro shop in the... In the um, in Rochester, so the, I mean, the scenes looked incredible. It would have been um, something special to be actually there, but uh, yeah, it's got to be that one. Absolutely, great answer. Um, next one, what is your go to or your stock shot? I have a nine wood, believe it or not, and it's come in very, very handy over the last mm -hmm. few years. Wow, yeah. I thought nine, nine woods were nearly gone at this stage. Very no, good. It's a, it's a special weapon that I have in the bag. Right, and Damn. is it a draw or a little fade, or is it just just bullet straight? Is it? Um, I can do quite a lot of things with it. Yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of tricks up my sleeve with that knife. <laughs> but... <laughs> right, you're going to your next one. Um, your hero, idol, growing up. Um, I suppose I had a few. I was obviously obviously looked up to Tiger, looked up to to Harrington was a, a big one. Um. And then Katie Taylor as well was also a big one, um, even though she wasn't a golfer. Just a, some of the things she did throughout her career was just incredible. Okay, your favourite movie? Oh. I, was, I was quite a big fan of the Harry Potter series growing up, but then big fan of Gladiator as well. Um, is also a favourite of mine. Brilliant. Brilliant. Next one, the toughest course that you play physically? Uh, we used to we used to play a course in um, our first event in the spring in college in Palos Verdes in California, um, and there was a lot of very very steep um, walks up some of them. So probably that one I would say. Right, and the most remote tournament that you've ever been to. Remote. Um, you've travelled all over the world. Where's the Whereas, well, maybe remote or yeah, furthest or the or the maddest kind of place that you've been to that you that you can remember. Um, I'm not we'll sure to be honest. We we'll let you off the hook with that yeah, one. We'll let you off, yeah, we will. Yeah, yeah. Right, I'm sure. Um, the next one here, you probably answer your favorite club in the bag. Yeah, it's gonna be the nine word. The nine word doesn't matter. <laughs> Shame to say, I'll walk down the aisle with that club. <laughs> <laughs> right, last one. You're nearly there. Okay, you're nearly, your dream four ball. Man. Um, my dream four ball, probably Tiger, uh, Serena Williams, and Muhammad Ali. Oh, man. Wow. Very good, very good, excellent. That's brilliant. Listen, Leon, thanks very, very much for that. One last thing. Um, I, I see you got to be part of one of the most uh, special traditions there, there is in golf. Um, at the end of January, you got two gold replica putters at the, the Ping um, vault. How was that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's really special, I suppose. I wasn't, wasn't expecting them. And then when I was, I was over getting my clubs checked again in Arizona there, um, it was just before I flew down to Australia. And, um, Scott brought me into the vault as you, as you do when you go to visit the factory and I was looking and then he um he brought out my two um with the faces engraved and it's it's I mean it's one of those special things that I'll I'll have forever and now they'll be in the vault forever. So um 
Glad I'd yeah. play with a pig potter. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there'll be many more in there before you, you finish up. Listen, many thanks okay. again. Um, very best wishes whenever this season gets back up and running. Uh, continued success and we really look forward to, to chatting to you soon. And again, lastly, it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, Leona. Thanks. Yeah. Leona, thanks a million. That was magic. I, I don't think I ever uh, I don't think I ever smiled as much uh, during it <laughs> yeah, for the whole hour true. in fairness. Yeah, Absolutely yeah. magic. I hope you enjoyed it that's as fine. much as we yeah. did. Um, just before we go, you might do us one mm. little favour. We'd love to have a little pre-recorded sting from you just saying, hi, Leona McGuire, here are <coughs> listening to the Three Off The Tea podcast. If you don't okay. mind. Do you want me to that. do that now or do you want me yeah, to Yeah, whenever you're ready. It's still re no, it's still recording. Whenever you're ready, yeah. Leona McGuire here. You're listening to off, what is it? Three off the tee. <laughs> yeah, go on. Start again. Yeah, yeah. Three off the tee. I can't believe you were going to say off the ball at one of our, <laughs> one of our rivals. <laughs> right, go on, shoot. Leona McGuire here. You're listening to Three Off the Tee podcast. Lovely, thank you, Leon. We, we let you out with that one. <laughs> Leona, mind yourself. Leo, thanks. Uh, thanks. Please, Cheers. God, we get to see you playing a bit of golf soon. All right. Pleasure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank thanks, guys. Take thank care. Stay safe. Bye bye. bye.